attack you, they are to give you first warning. One fires his gun, the other one runs back and says, guys, get ready. But it takes a lot of discipline because it's scary. Right? Every sound, is that an enemy coming to get me? You know, uh, leaves blowing on a tree stump or those arms coming at me. And your mind plays crazy tricks on you. So normally you have a seasoned veteran with a young guy out there, you know, to, to kind of stabilize. Well, right now everybody's green. And the guys in the outpost are like, man, it's cold out here. This sure, like, sucks. <laughs> All right. And then around 4 or 5 o'clock, er, 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 they begin to hear, you know, roosters crowing. Man, there's chickens about. Heck with getting that garbage, nasty food. Let's go get some eggs. And so the guys do the worst thing possible. They get out of their foxholes, their observation posts, and they go scrounging around the countryside to get eggs. And they got eggs in their hats. And little do they know that Sherman, earlier that night, was within about 800 yards of where Albert Sidney Johnston had massed his Confederate soldiers. Now, they had started marching a couple days before on April the 3rd. But his guys were green. Shoot, ain't there a spring over there? Let's go swimming. Man, I know where some, some good blackberries are. Let's go. And guys were breaking ranks and running. And the average army at the time under decent conditions, can march 18 to 20 miles a day, all right? They've gone six to seven miles in two days, all right? So they're at a glaciatic pace. There's nobody in there hooting and hollering, yay, let's go, all right, yay. And PG2, would you guys shut up? Be quiet. This is a surprise attack. The key to a surprise attack is to shut up. Well, that didn't work for you over there at Fort Sumter and Bull Run because you got so shut up. We know what we're doing. Oh, yeah, my God. Do you know what a surprise means? And so finally, Johnson has everybody organized. Him and Beauregard get into this heated argument. Look, we might want to turn around. Everybody, hell, hell, Abraham Lincoln knows we're coming as much noise as your boys make. And Sidney Johnston goes, I will fight them if they were a million. I don't care. Tonight, I don't care how much noise we make, we are going to water our horses in the Tennessee River. I don't care if they know we're coming, we're going at them, and we're going to hit it as hard as we possibly can. Well, what's going to happen is the guys carrying their eggs back, Here's a little, I guess you want to see the map. Here's the Tennessee River, and here is you know, Sherman's Cavalry. The three Union soldiers, or armies, are going to get hit by everything that Sidney Johnston has, and they're slowly going to get pushed back this way, almost to the Tennessee River. It's going to be a nasty, knockdown, drag out fight here in, in, in a second. And it's this foggy morning, can't see. The guys carrying eggs here, it's zhoop, 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 zhoop. You hear that? I don't know, that's a weird sound. Zhoop, 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 zhoop. Well, the guys in the Western Theater were some of the first guys issued um, standard Confederate uniforms. And their pants were all corduroy. Right? So as they're walking, it's like, shoop, 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 shoop. And the guys now, instead of, you know, four or five hundred yards or one, two miles away, and they turn around, holy crap, coming out of the fog is the entire Confederate army. So they throw their eggs down and start running. But some of them left their rifles in their foxholes. Some of them dropped their rifles and just started running. Guys, guys, guys! But they're too far away to give warning. And all of a sudden, the Confederates begin shooting. Grant is up early, and he's having breakfast. He's like, oh, what's all that shooting out there? Oh, it's just a matter of the pickets. They're firing their weapons to make sure their powder isn't wet. And it only gets louder and louder. And he's like, well, why isn't it quieting down? Well, you know, the new guys are firing their guns. It's okay. Grant's like, no, something ain't right. Get my horse saddled, and off Grant goes. And the Union Army has almost no time to get ready. Out in front are two Ohio regiments. The Ohio 71st is the farthest out. Their colonel 
sees the Confederates coming out of the fog, he jumps on his horse, turns around, and heads straight back for the riverboat landing. His lieutenant colonel goes, come on guys, let's rally, load your weapons. He turns and is immediately shot by a group of men from Alabama. The 71st doesn't know what to do. They stand there stunned and they're all shot or bayoneted by the 15th Alabama Regiment. They just fold. Next to them, Sherman rides up to the Ohio 53rd, his men. says, Colonel, you stay right here. I'm going to get help. As soon as Sherman got out of, um, you know, uh, line of sight, the lieutenant colonel said, guys, every man for himself, let's go. All right? Some ran and some stayed. And the opening was just sheer chaos. And afterwards, reports come back that the one guy who stayed calm was Ulysses Grant. For the next 12 to 15 hours, he was in the saddle of his horse. When it's all said and done, they count that night, his aide, there were 16 bullet holes either in his coat, his pants, or notches in his horse's saddle. But Grant and his horse will come out unscathed. And they said wherever the battle was its most fiercest, there was Grant. Stay calm, do this, this is what I want you to do, I'm going to get your reinforcements, are you guys good here? Then he would ride off to another part of the line going back and forth, back and forth all day. And guys describe him, if you ever remember um, like George Washington at the Battle of Monmouth when the Continental Army started to break and Washington showed, started screaming at him, yelling at him, cussing him, hitting with his mm -hmm. horse reins, and they stabilized and won their first victory. Or the Duke of Wellington, you know, bringing the men up for the last fatal charge at Waterloo. So wherever things were at their most intense, Grant would just show up and everything would all of a sudden calm down. And the thing with green or new soldiers, you have one or two types. Um, there's always the guys who are going to like, you know, pee their pants or whatever and freak out and scream and run. Usually the big loud talker, like, oh, I'm going to take them all, I'm going to kill them all, um, turns and runs. And it's the quiet little guy that nobody paid, paid like, you know, the, the Audie Murphys and guys like that, that just do um, tremendous work. Well, green soldiers are either going to break and run or they're going to stand there. And they're going to stand there and they're going to fight because they don't know what else to do. Well, both soldiers on both sides just stand and fight in one of the most savage, bloody battles of the entire Civil War. Um, very underrated that these guys, by all rights, and, and, and you couldn't blame them, they all should have ran. But most, some do, but most guys just stood there manfully under this incredible pounding, and they fought, and they didn't even know what they were doing. Slowly but surely, Grant's men are being pushed back. And he tells Sherman, we can't get pushed back over the hill. If they get the high ground and we lose momentum and go back to the riverboat landing, we're dead. So we cannot go back past the church under any circumstances. And they say, um, Sherman said later, that they lost more men in the first five minutes of the battle than they did the entire rest of the day. Once the shock and the chaos was over, everyone just kind of settled in and they looked dead at them. They fought whoever was in front of them. They moved from tree to rock to tree stump without any organization whatsoever. They just kind of did what they felt necessary. If there's four or five guys here fighting, I'm going to jump in and uh, join you. And there's a story of this guy named A.C. Voris. And he was up front laughing. Boys, they're just big gray squirrel, squirrels. Don't worry, he's shooting, he's shooting. And Grant says, you know, Colonel, you know, you're shooting too much. Slow down. How many times have you fired your rifle? 37, sir. Well, God, that's a lot of ammunition. Well, I hit 36 of them, sir. I had to shoot one twice. And Grant says, well, keep shooting. All right, all right. Go, go. You, go. you go right on ahead. All right, I'm, 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 I'm all right with that. So Ben Prentice is going to be the guy on the far left. And as the entire Union Army retreats, his men kind of fall back doggedly, and they run into that sunken road. 
that sunken ditch. And they jumped down in it. And it turns out when they got down, they were about chest high. So the only thing the Confederates could see was like their neck and their chins. And Prentice read books on classical military history, and he said, guys, I want three to four rows deep, and I want you pointed in all directions. Row number one, you're going to fire your weapon. As soon as you fire it, you stand up and go to the back of the line and start reloading. I want the second group ready to fire. And by the time number one is back up front, you better have your weapon reloaded. Now, the best guys could load and fire a Civil War era rifle or musket about three to four times per minute. Those were most guys, to, and that's not when you're panicked and, and, and like freaking out. But what Prentice does is he puts up 180 degree circumference of fire all around his area. Anything that came near it gets blasted. And so Ben Prentice is going to command what is known as the hornet's nest. And him standing with three to four hundred soldiers down in this sunken road holds the entire Confederate army at bay. A bit of it sweeps around to the right. And a little bit sweeps around to the left, but it's blocked by a river. And that's where Grant is riding back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Prentice kind of has the middle. To the rear, the Union Army is in pandemonium. Guys are jumping in the river. They're trying, oh my God, we're all dead. We're all going to die. They're overloading riverboats. Some guys are chopping down trees to try and get them you know, to jump in and get to the other side of the river. But the Tennessee is deep. It had been raining. It was running very swift. And the other side of the riverboat landing was a sheer cliff. So hundreds of guys are drowning. Some are crying, you know, please God help us. But it's only about 25% of the army. Up in front of them, some of the nastiest fighting in the entire Civil War is going on. Just a couple hundred yards in, in front of them. And it's 8.15 here, so I'll kind of speed this up. Um, the Battle of the Hornet's Nest becomes legendary. The Confederates attack it 15 times. And across from the Hornet's Nest is this little field coming slightly downhill, and there's this patch of woods. And wave after wave of Confederates run across that Field. First, there were like bramble bushes and pricker bushes, and they're all mowed down. Fires is coming out. They bring up cannons, and they're firing the cannons down at the sunken road, but the solid cannonballs hit the ground in front and bounce them over top. And there's another thing known as canister shot. And canister looks like this. It's like a coffee can packed with about golf ball-sized hunks of, of lead. And when it flew out of the mouth of the cannon, it acted like a giant shotgun. Just one of those steel hunks would rip off a, a limb. It was short-range stuff. And they're firing it, and it was tearing down the trees behind the hornet's nest, but they couldn't decline their guns to get in there. And so the pile of Confederate bodies is stacking up again and again and again. And finally, Albert Sidney Johnston shows up. He says, boys, we got to get through this. And the guy said, you know, General, you know, they're fighting like a, like a mad nest of hornets. We could hold up a bushel basket, and it would be filled with lead in no time by them Yankee fellers up there. And at the time, the Confederates said that every Confederate soldier was worth 10 Union soldiers. The Union was saying the same thing. Well, Shiloh, they find out that this isn't true. So Shiloh says, so Johnson says, okay, boys, we're going to fire two volleys of cannon, solid shot, then canister, and then follow me and let's charge. Kaboom! The cannons, you know, fire out. They reload. Kaboom! He waves his sword, and he's on his horse riding across this, the field, and Prentice's men pop up like little prairie dogs, and they begin firing. And Johnston sees his men falling all around him, he gets about 50 yards out into the field. He sees his men have no chance. He waves his sword and orders a retreat. Being the good officer he is, 
He stands and waits. He looks right, looks left. His men are off the field, and he turns to ride off. And as he does, one last gunshot rings out. He looks around. Can't hit a guy on a horse, you know, loser, um, whatever. And he gets back to his lines and says, you know what? We're going to have to find another way to get around the hornet's nest. And as he starts to ride away, he sees a wounded, captured Confederate colonel who is bleeding badly. And he says to his own surgeon, see to this officer, make sure he's well treated. And he rides down this hill to the bottom near a beautiful peach orchard. He begins to give orders, and he looks at PGT Beauregard and falls off his horse. And his men are like, General, are you okay? General, did you slip? And they jump down, and, my God, he's dead. Like, what? And they, you know, start pulling his you know, hat off and feeling for blood and ripping his shirt open, and there's nothing there. Someone says, look at his leg. Well, his aide pulled off his right boot. His right boot up to the knee had filled up with blood. It's believed that the last shot at the hornet's nest went in the back of his knee, severed his femoral artery, whether it was the leather or adrenaline, he never felt it, and Albert Sidney Johnston is stone cold dead. So now, PGT Beauregard is like, oh my God, what are we going to do? Beauregard says we can't let the men know that the general is killed, so tie his horse to a tree and move him off to the side and cover him with a blanket and some brush, and we won't tell anybody. And they keep attacking. Finally, they drag more cannons up, and they're blasting it at the hornet's nest. And the fight has now gone on. It's about 3, 3.30 in the afternoon. It's hot. Guys are tired, and they're still fighting. No matter what, they can't get Prentice out of that stinking hornet's nest. But Prentice is beginning to run low on ammunition. How much longer can he hold out? Well, around 4, 4.30, Prentice runs out of ammunition, and he's forced to do the unthinkable. He raises a flag of surrender. Just as the right and left wings were about to break through, word has it, that the hornet's nest has surrendered. So guys, because they don't know any better, they stop fighting, and they go to the hornet's nest, and they want to shake Prentice's hand, and they want to trade Yankee soldiers. Here's my Confederate hat. Here's a belt buckle for one of yours. They literally ask Prentice for autographs. It's unbelievable. I can't do this. In this modern age where on Friday night we play a football game or a basketball game with a rival from East Chapel Hill, and then we spend Friday night together eating pizza to go play a, like a travel team game the next day, I can't do that. Like when I, I'm, it takes me hours to calm down. All right? So you are not my friend. I'm not shaking your hand. I don't care. And these guys, hey, man, that was a good fight. You put it up there. Can I get give you my belt buckle for your hat. Like, no, get the hell away from me, all right? I'll shoot you in the face. Get away. All right, get out of here. All right. So anyhow, um, over to the left, this peach orchard was this, like, bizarre, like, futuristic, you know, um, Armageddon-ish um, painting where these beautiful peach trees covered with peach, peach blossoms were almost like they were cut in half by like a, a cleaver or a samurai sword and all these pink petals are falling on soldiers who are firing at each other across the peach orchard and the river of blood is so um, deep it begins to flow down the hill carrying these peach puddles and petals into this spring farm pond that was fouled by the death and destruction around um, Shiloh, and it's called Bloody Pond to this um, very day. It has never been able to um, uh, cleanse itself. So anyway, that night, Grant's army is freaking out. Part of it's crying down by the riverbank. Another part is shot up. Another part is surrendered. Another, you know, part is still trying to fight, but they don't know what's going on. And all of a sudden, Lou Wallace shows up. Grant's like, where you been? I needed your help. Oh, well, we got lost. Lou, you went <laughs> up the river, all right? If you needed to get back here, if the river was on your right shoulder, put the river 
on your left shoulder, Ace. Didn't you hear all the damn fighting? Oh, well, you know, it all kind of looks the same in Mississippi. No, it actually doesn't, Lou, all right? There's a big freaking river. I needed your men. Well, don't worry. I got General Buell. And Don Carlos Buell's men come up cocky. Oh, man, you crying wimps. Oh, we're here now. We'll go take care of these, you know, reps for you. And as they walk up out of the riverboat landing, they see... This shock of everything burnt, cut up, on fire, dead body parts, men screaming and on their bravado and their cockiness left him instantly. And Grant was mad as hell that night. And Grant was like Lee, didn't lose his temper. And they're, you know, apparently when you're about ready to, to, to die in combat, you cry for, cry for cool water or your mother. Like, Mama! Please help me. Can somebody give me a drink of water? And Grant said it was driving him crazy. And all of a sudden, this gentle rain came. And Grant said, God must have heard the pleas of the wounded. He sent them a brief, cool shower to calm them down. And Grant was leaning up against this oak tree. The big tornado a few years ago that blew away Joplin, um, Mississippi, toppled all but the stump of, of this tree. And there's cannonballs there now. And Grant was just sitting there, kind of like this. And everybody was afraid to go near him. Like, dude, Grant is just hot. He's mad. He's just furious. He's going to kill somebody. And the only guy not afraid to approach him is his buddy Sherman. Sherman walks up and says, hey, bad day today, Grant. Who's that? Uh, it was it was the devil's own ding today, Sam. Grant says, yeah. Well, we're going to lick him tomorrow, though. And he looks at Sherman and he says, well, I'm going to get fired for this. Or I'm going to lose my job. But remember what I told you last night when I wrote to Julia that it's my, my hope that this war will soon be over because the other side apparently lacks the will to fight? He goes, that's a load of crap. During the battle, Grant says he had this epiphany moment, moment. He was riding back and forth, getting shot at. And had this thought that crystallized itself in his mind. He said, these people, these Confederates, are never going to be beaten. All right? They're never going to quit. You have to beat them and beat them and beat them until they can take no more and then beat them again. Because they are never going to quit. You're going to have to beat them let them know they're beaten. He brings up a quote that Alexander the Great used to say, when you have a wounded animal, you have to drive the spear deep into it, pin it to the ground, and finish it off. Because if you let it go, it's very dangerous. And he says, Will, you're going to have to leave a permanent mark upon the earth. You are going to have to cause such destruction that they know they're beaten because they will never stop. So it's right here that Grant kind of foreshadows what will be Sherman's march to the sea. These guys are so tough, whatever you guys were saying, all oh, those Rebs ain't nothing, you know, one of us is as good as ten of them, hey, fight like hell, all right? This is not going to be a group of people that we can easily put down. We're going to have to beat them. You guys remember the old show 24? Anybody like Jack Bauer? Oh, yeah. All right, all right. When Jack Bauer killed a bad guy, well, he shot him, stabbed him, ran him over, ran him through a chipper shredder, poured battery acid on him, lit him on fire, and cased him in cement. When Jack Bauer, it was not like, you know, Friday the 13th and, you know, the bad guy. No, when Jack was done with you, you were not coming back. Well, Grant is, so we got to jack, we have to jack Bauer, the Confederacy, all right? We can't let them up for a second, or they're going to come back at us. And so the next, that night, he orders his two gunboats, I want you to fire at random intervals, three minutes, seven minutes, five minutes, what he wants to shoot at, I don't care, just shoot that direction so you don't hit any of our guys. Well, Why? Because I don't want the Confederates to get one single wink of sleep. Sail back and forth and just <laughs> shoot off your guns. Says, Tomorrow, we're going to have to finish this. Well, at dawn on April the 7th, he begins a counterattack. Him and Don Carlos Buell and their combined forces begin to shove into Albert Sidney Johnston's men. And the fighting on day two was just as fierce as the fighting on day one. 
and the Confederates were driven step for step back across the ground they had fought so hard to capture the next day. About 3 o'clock, Beauregard sees his men are fought out, and there's a story that Sherman told that there was this Union artillery guy yelling at these Confederates down in this briar patch. Like, you know, you know, Br'er Rabbit. Come on out! Sherman's like, what are you doing? He's like, well, I think there's some Rebs down in there, but they won't come out. Well, you need to persuade them. Hurry up. About an hour later, Sherman came back, and the briar patch was just shot to shreds. He said, what were you doing? Well, we were firing canister down in there. Well, what for? Well, you told us to persuade them, and them Yankee, or them rebel boys took a lot of persuading. When they waded in, they found 27 dead horses and 150 dead Confederate soldiers that wouldn't surrender. They were obliterated by a canister shot rather than that Shiloh. And as it was done, as um, Beauregard's men begin to retreat back to Corinth, instead of running them to ground, Grant's men just kind of shoot them. Like, we're going we're gonna to get close enough to make sure that you don't turn and counterattack us, but we don't really want to fight um, anymore. And legendarily, the last shot fired at Shiloh was fired by Nathan Bedford Forrest, um, who was a uh, southern civilian. He was an animal trader and became a slave trader. And with his own money, outfitted 500 cavalrymen, saying, if you want to kill Yankees, ride for me. So he's never officially in the Confederate Army, but he claims the rank of a colonel. And he's riding around making sure the Union soldiers stay just far enough back. And four guys come out of the bushes and surround him. There he is. Kill him. Kill the gosh darn rebel. And he turns as a Union soldier tries to bayonet him. And the, and the bayonet misses, and the guy shoots, and it goes through Bedford Forrest's ribcage. And I'm not a big Nathan Bedford Forrest fan, but if this really happened... Uh, he's pretty cool. He reaches down, grabs the Union soldier by the scruff of the neck, yanks him up on his horse, uses him as a human shield, rides away, throws him down, salutes, and then gallops off back to Corinth. And that is supposedly the last shot fired at the Great Battle of Shiloh. And when the dust settles, over 25,000 soldiers are killed and wounded and missing. It's horrific. People can't get over it. This was more people than the United States had lost in all other wars combined up to this point. Modern day, if a general loses 7 to 9% of his men, it's considered catastrophic loss. All right, if you, the Battle of Mogadishu, Black Hawk down, right? that was an 8% loss. General resigned. You know, get on down the road. This was near 30. Right? 30%. Right? Incredible. Shocking. Right? It equaled Napoleon's losses at Waterloo. And how you found out that you were dead, wounded, or missing, they would go to the church and the town hall and they would nail the names to the door. And it's phone book thick. Little town in Maine, Deer Isle, Maine, every man in it over the age of 15 was killed at Shiloh. So the ladies just moved away. It is now a historic site on the coast of Maine. None of the men ever came back. It was shocking. People didn't know what to do. Here's this guy saying you could wipe up the blood spilled in the Civil War with one handkerchief. First Bull Run was really not all that bad. 20,000 people? You've got to be kidding me. And Shiloh woke America up to what the Civil War was going to be like. Right? It was like Guadalcanal in World War II, all right? which the government suppressed until President Roosevelt said, ah, I think we probably ever better tell people what, what's going on out here. No one could handle this. People called for Grant's head on a platter. But nobody knew there were 30 more Waterloos yet to come. All right? Number one being um, Antietam. 625,000 people will be killed or wounded in four years of the Civil War. We get 25,000 in one blow. As a result of this, 
Because he was a big name, everyone says Grant was drunk. In reality, Grant wasn't a drunk. When he missed his wife, when he was lonely, every now and then he would go on a bender for like a day or two, but normally when he was off duty. So calling Grant a drunk is really not true, but it's a way to get him benched. Mary Todd Lincoln lost a half-brother in a uh, confederate, and she said, my husband will fire Ulysses Grant. And Jefferson Davis said, our strongest pillar is cracked. How are we going to win without Albert Sidney Johnson? And so, it's a young Illinois beat reporter. I know we got to go here for the basketball game. Elihu Washburn was a Chicago Sun-Times news reporter, and he knew Lincoln from the circuit when um, Lincoln was a lawyer and um, the uh, Lincoln-Douglas debates. And when he hears that Lincoln um, is going to fire and he puts Grant behind a desk, he goes to Washington and gets an appointment. He says, President Lincoln, I, oh, Elihu, what's going on? You're here to write a good article about me? Well, yeah, but i got to tell you, sir, I was out west, and I was with Grant when he arrested his own friend, Simon Buckner. i got to tell you how that ended. And i got to tell you, sir, I was at Shiloh, and the only guy that seemed to know what the heck was going on was Ulysses Grant. And as a prisoner... Many of the Confederate officers said, man, you know who the heck I wish we had fighting for us? It was that guy riding around on his horse all day. It was Ulysses Grant. He goes, so, sir, he wasn't drunk. I know a lot of guys died, but if it wasn't for him, we would have lost that battle. And Lincoln says, well, the heck with it. I don't care if he is drunk. He's the only general I got that's fighting and winning. And Grant reinsert, or Lincoln reinserts Grant as general and sends him on out west for the next big battle. Um, if you ever get a chance to go to Shiloh, there is the cemetery. It's absolutely beautiful. Right down here in this dark path is the riverboat landing that goes down. It's extremely picturesque. The only problem is you're about three hours from anything. Yeah. All right. You got maybe Memphis, or maybe what's the town that, um, oh God, I forget his name right now. Psycho T, come on, number 50, I'm trying to blank. Carolina basketball. Hansborough. Tyler Hansborough, yeah, Poplar Bluff. All right. I mean, it's really, there is nothing there, but it was really cool, a really neat little cemetery. And that's it for this week, guys. Ooh, can't believe we did that. And now I'm ahead. <laughs> <laughs> I almost forgot. Grant did go get Simon out of prison. He paid for his release. He gave him sixty dollars. He said, "Said Simon, I got you out. We're even up. If I ever fight and capture you again, I can't do this twice." So please do not re-engage me. Whenever Simon Bolivar found out where Grant was, he asked to be reassigned so he didn't have to fight his buddy for the rest of the war. Next week, you're going to be really frustrated in the Peninsula Campaign when the Union Army wins six and a half battles and still finds a way to lose. And if you ever go to Washington, go up to Arlington House by the front door there's always a rocking chair. Sit in that rocking chair and kind of channel your Robert E. Lee. Like, what would, what, I wish he would have taken the job. This whole thing would have been over. All right. If you have any questions, I'll be around. If not, guys, I'll see you next week, hopefully. Thank you. Thank you.